Hi there, I'm Eric Ward Weaver Shervin, Goldie of the Ridgar Folk here in East Texas, and I would like to welcome you to the Raven's Call. Glad Yule, folks. This is my Yule special. It's not really a special, it's just an episode where I talk about Yule oriented things, and that kind of is the, uh, the, the subject matter of the day, as it were. But, housekeeping first. Big UPG warning at the beginning of this episode, like always. Uh, my, I'm not an authority on anything. I'm not the Asa Pope. I'm not some master of whatever, blah, 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 blah. I'm just a guy. I'm, I'm one Gothi here in the East Texas area, and this channel is all about my views, my approach, and my insights when it comes to heathenry. Things that are, you know, set my mind on fire, you know, tickle my fancy at the time. And, um, you know, they're meant to be conversation starters more than anything else. Not really meant to be you know, the end-all, be-all of anything. So keep that in mind going forward. Um, anything that I put out there, feel free to do your own research on. My intention is for you to come away from my videos maybe thinking a little bit outside the box, a little bit outside your comfort zone, or maybe just thinking about things that you haven't thought about before within context of heathenry, and maybe growing a little bit in your own understanding, in your own hearth culture, tribal culture, etc., etc. Now, all of my contact information is down below. You guys understand the deal there. Please do send in questions, send in uh, you know, show ideas, anything. I look at all of it, and honestly, a lot of my best shows come from viewer requests because you guys ask great questions that I wouldn't necessarily have thought to put down into a video um, because it's either something I assume everybody already knows or just something that I hadn't thought about putting into video. Uh, maybe something I thought about ages ago and had never come back to. So I love seeing those things. Please keep them coming. Uh, they are the bread and butter of the channel. I love that kind of stuff, and I love having the viewer involvement in it. If I if it's not something I can turn into an episode, if it's something that's just like a little one-off kind of thing, I'll try and reply to you with an answer. Um, you know, you guys that follow the channel know that I don't have a whole lot of free time at the moment. I am working two jobs, and it's like 17-hour days, uh, five days a week. But I'm doing what I can, and I'll plug it in as I can. Uh, it just may be quite some time between replies, simply because I'm not in front of a screen doing that very often. Now, I did post up here recently, I reposted to the group my uh, chapter two of my book uh, that I had recorded a while back, and uh, that is the story of Nils Bjornsson from the saga of Bjorn Thorolfsson. And he is, it's a Yuletide Carol, is what I call it. So if you haven't gone and listened to that particular story, now's a fantastic time to go and do so. Uh, for those of us that are still in the midst of Yule, you know, this is a great time for it. For those that are just beginning their run, uh, because the lunar calendar shifts Yule more into the late December, early January area, um, rock on. And if not, you know, it's still a good story. So. Please give it a look, give it a listen, and uh, you know, let me know what you think. And if you have picked up my book for any particular reason, uh, personal reading or gift for Yule, etc., etc., please do leave me a review so that it helps to push those numbers out there so that people can see it and people know that it's there. If you enjoy it, if not, you know, no, I'm done. I get it. <laughs> it's not for everybody, uh, but for those that it is for, I would very much appreciate your your feedback. I would appreciate the positive feedback, but I'll appreciate any feedback uh, just simply because it's what I do. And uh, I'm, I've, I have ideas for new books. I don't have time to sit and write new books. And when I do have time, I don't have energy. But I do have things rattling around for some new stuff. Um, some of it is continuation of the Bjorn Thorolfsson storyline. Uh, some on down the road kind of stuff. Uh, continuation of that bloodline kind of deal. Uh, but then I've got some other ideas that are heathen related within fiction context. And I've had some people tell me that I need to make a Heathenry 101 book. There's a reason that I don't do a Heathenry 101 book. Um, you can't. You really can't. Uh, my entire channel is dedicated to kind of giving my viewpoint on Heathenry, but I find that Heathenry 101 books are superficial and boiled down for a reason. There's no good way to encapsulate what is Heathenry into the confines of a singular book. And especially not to give the understanding of the emphasis of hearth culture versus tribal culture versus clan culture 
and the different ways these different elements interact, the spiritual, religious, the the cultural side of things, the philosophical side of things. Um, it's difficult to boil all of that down into a book that doesn't sound either dry and boring as all get out, or is way, written like way over the heads of newbies coming in, or that doesn't sound like I'm trying to be the Asa Pope. I'm not trying to be the Asa Pope. It's not what it's about. Um, so I prefer spoken word when it comes to things like that anyway. So uh, if you've got newbies, newbies out there that are trying to learn, uh, turn them onto the channel. Share out that Heathenry 101 video I did way back in the day, like three years ago. You know, I missed the three-year anniversary for the channel, by the way. That was back in, I think, November. I uh, completely blanked on the fact that it was the three-year anniversary for the channel. I can't believe this has been going on for three years. It's absolutely ridiculous. But anyway, share the links around, you know, revisit some old stuff, share out the new stuff, let people know it's there, and uh, hopefully it will help those that need help. Anyway, let's continue on. Today's subject matter is Yule. It is Yuletide. Uh, at least it is for me and mine. Uh, the Rithgari, we celebrate Yule from the 19th through the 31st every year. It's the only holiday that we actually base on a calendar year. This is a prime example of one of the things that I wanted to talk about with today's subject matter. And that is one of the things with relation to Yule. Because I usually talk about a couple of different points. One of the things that I experience or that I've seen is this need to homogenize Yule into one thing for all heathens. And if you follow my channel, you know that's very much not my approach. Yule is, uh, heathenry itself is not just one thing. It is not just one approach. Heathenry is a term that is slapped onto a vast um, variety of cultures that have some commonality, largely tied around the deities that they worship and some cultural nuances that are cohesive and consistent across cultural boundaries. But when you boil it down, heathenry is a term that is slapped onto tribal traditions that span a huge amount of time and a huge amount of distance. And so no one picture of heathenry fits every single tribe, and it shouldn't. It never was that way. It never will be that way. To boil it down to some homogenous one-size-fits-all thing uh, is to lose the heart of what heathenry is. It, it destroys some of the key elements, like one of the key elements to Ridgar and our approach to things is that the hearth cult is sovereign. You know, our tribe won't overreach into the practices of the hearth cult. The hearth cult is sovereign and is respected as such, and that's what makes it work. Because we can come together and interact on agreed upon rules within the tribal setting, but when they go home, they do what they want at home, as long as it doesn't bring ill luck to the tribe or damage our relationship with the gods and goddesses or the community around us. Uh, that's just one of those does it do we fit each other kind of things and uh, as such um, I, I, I don't try and say you know this is how Ridgar practices Yule no Yule traditions are set heavily on the hearth cult level that's where it should be because when you boil down to the essence of what is Yule about you know, you can go with the approach of, you know, the rebirth of the sun, the rebirth of the new year and things like that. That's not really the why of why we do it, all right, as far as Ridgar goes. Um, yes, we look to the coming of the new year and things like that, but that's not the crux of our holiday. Yule is the time that we see as outside of time the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022. This is the time where we are outside of the calendar year. It is a period of time where we break. Um, within the Storm Spear tribe, it is the time when the storm ebbs, when we gather under the same shelter and wait it out a little bit. You know, it's kind of an eye of the storm sort of thing. This is a time outside of time where we take and purposefully make time for each other, and specifically spend quality time together so that we are appreciating what is the crux, what is the why of our holiday, and that is hearth, clan, and tribe. See, you hear me talk on the channel a lot about the whys. Why do we do this? Whys are important. Whys are the crux. Whys are the everything. If you look to your why, then the how and the what will work themselves out. They'll be logical at that point. 
You know, if you understand why you celebrate a holiday, then what you do to celebrate that holiday and how you make that work, you, you have a plan for that then. You have a, a driving force. And if your why isn't a driving enough motivation, then maybe you need to reassess your why. And so for us, within our tribe at least, um, family is the drive of Yule. That is the essence of what we do. This is the time where the veil is the thinnest. This is the time where the wild hunt rides across Midgar. This is a time where we can access our ancestors more easily than any other time of the year. And we enjoy that. We take advantage of that. We bring them to feast with us. And we enjoy that reconnection and the sharing of luck that we get at that time. It is a time when the gods' attention is turned towards Midgard, uh, especially Odin. This is a very Odin-centric time of year. And that's something I kind of want to come back to here in just a second. But um, one of the viewers wrote in and asked me specifically, he, he's kind of new to heathenry and still trying to figure all this out, and uh, this is one of his early Yules as far as, you know, I, don't, I don't remember exactly how long he's been here, but it's been very short, uh, less than five years anyway. I believe. And <laughs> not that it's important to the question. Uh, he wanted to know how does one celebrate Yule? And I told him I'd, I'd try and do a more in depth answer, but I basically gave him a whole, you know, you do what you do kind of thing answer. Because the essence of how does one celebrate Yule, well, that is a very tribal, very hearth cult centric answer. As a matter of fact, I would say that how you celebrate Yule is more hearth cult then tribe cult. Uh, essentially what it boils down to in all of it is that what you do to celebrate the holiday depends on the specific traditions that you maintain within your home. How much of them are secular? How much of them are tied to heathenry? How much of them are built on fond childhood memories? And I've talked about this in previous Yuletide videos, but I want to make sure that people understand that traditions are important. Traditions keep alive the spirit. And if you understand the why of a tradition, then you can understand why this needs to continue. And how you go about continuing that begins to make sense. So, like for instance, I have very minor traditions that I like to do during Yuletide. There's a couple of movies that I like to watch. There are specific reasons why I like to watch them. You guys have heard me talk about it. I even did a review back when I was doing the Raving Raven reviews. Um, which, that was very short-lived because uh, I took on too much. I took on too much and didn't have the time to do it right. And uh, so, ultimately speaking, that one had to go. So anyway, uh, back when I was doing those, the RRRs, the triple Rs, I was doing, uh, I did one on I Remember Mama. This is a movie that I watch every year around Yuletide. The reason that I do this is because this specific movie, for me is a perfect Yule movie. It is all about family, it is all about tradition, it is all about overcoming obstacles together and being a unit, and it's wholesome, it's deep. It's that kind of storytelling that you don't see in modern movies anymore. The entire thing is told as far as in like maybe three sets, and it's very, it, it's based on a book, and it's extremely wholesome. It's about a Norwegian immigrant family that comes over to California California, and is just living life and the things that they go through and this strong Norwegian mama, a strong Norwegian daddy, and these kids that were raised in America. So you have these Americanized kids, first generation American kids, but you've got old world mama and daddy. And it's interesting to see the cultural nuances at play. And they're real because it's based on reality. It's based on this book. And it's wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful. And because of that, I watch it every year in order to r remind myself at a deep level what it's about and why I do it. You know, it helps to rekindle my why. So that is the why, my why is the why, <laughs> that I watch the movie every year. And it's a tradition for me. And I try to maintain that. I try to keep it up because it's important. And I do other things within the movie in order to make, uh, make it enjoyable it's always enjoyable. I love the movie. You know, I'll watch it a thousand times. It doesn't matter. But I have little movie games that I play. 
Um, there's a character in there, Uncle Chris. When you watch the movie, it'll make sense. There's a toasting scene. I always partake in the toast. Uh, that makes no sense unless you've seen the movie, but I always partake in the toast. Um, I smoke cigars, so usually in the scene with the pipe, I'm puffing away on my cigar and laughing my butt off. I'm singing along with Uncle Chris when he's singing his songs. There's, there's fun, interactive things I do uh, that when my tribe watches it with me, uh, I get them in on it too because it's just fun. But it helps to perpetuate that. That gets into the how. How do you perpetuate these traditions? Well, you make them fun. You know, you get to the why, you get to the what, and the how, well, you make it fun. You incorporate it into different ways. Um, there are certain traditions I don't always get to do, like one of the traditions I like to do during Yule, but isn't an absolute must, is I like to make lefse. It's one of the things that I'm good at. I don't cook very much, but I do make lefse, and I am good at it. I'm very good at it. And I like it. I like lefse, I like to make lefse, and I love to watch people eat my lefse and see their faces lighten up. Um, because it, it touches my heart, especially the first time I cooked it and I gave it to my daddy and he was like, that's just like my grandmother used to make. It's like, oh, set my heart on fire. Loved it. Loved it, loved it. But, and that's honestly part of the reason why I continue to do lefse is because it is a tie to my family. And so there's, there's part of the why, you know. Uh, part of the why is just the, <clears throat> that, that dopamine jolt that I get from, you know, sharing with people and enjoy, them enjoying it. You know, but a large part of it is that family tie and encouraging that, you know, rebuilding on that, rekindling that. Again, focused on the family. That's my, my drive on all of this. Hearth cult, clan cult, tribe cult. We do, so I, I do all that. I do the lefsa, I do the movies. We do our tribal tradition every year is that we get the tribe together on Mother's Night. And we do our uh, bloat to the mothers, to the Deesir. We do a uh, sumble wherein we give our gifts and then we kind of share stories from throughout the year. We honor those that have passed throughout the year or from years past, whatever it may be. We congratulate each other. We boast upon one another for overcoming whatever it is that we have, uh, weathering the storm, as it were. Again, Rhythgar with the whole storm motif. Uh, but we do. We, we take some time to appreciate our tribe, and we specifically set this time aside. We'll take vacation time off. We'll do whatever we can to make sure that we're available. And we get as many of the members together as we can. We were lucky enough this year that we got all of the active members, including our prospect, um, together for the Mother's Night festivities. And we got to give gifts. We got to share laughs. We got to drink a bit. We had just a, a blast. And we reveled in our why. We reveled in tribe, because that is the driving force. We took a moment to appreciate what was important. And that's the crux of Yule for us. And I hope, for many of you, that's the crux there as well. We specifically set things up so that gift giving is not extravagant, because nobody's got money. <laughs> None of us do. We're all hardworking folk that need every penny that we've got. And we have large clans that you know, even a little bit doled out over a lot of clan ends up being very expensive. And so gifts are heartfelt. They're meaningful, but they're not expensive. They're manageable. So that's a thing to think about. If you're looking at doing gift exchange with your tribe, maybe set a limit so that those that are more affluent don't overshadow those that are not. Those that have had a harder year may not necessarily have the money or the time to be able to, you know, contribute at that level. And that's fine. They don't need to. Um, I love it when the craftspeople in the tribe get groovy with their crafting. One of our, our very dear friends of the tribe, who I wish she would just go ahead and join the tribe, but you know what it is. <laughs> uh, she gave out some wonderful gifts that were all her home brewed up spices that she'd done. Um, different mixes and rubs and things like that. Fantastic. Minor, not expensive, and heartfelt, meaningful, and plays to her strengths. I've done wood, I've done wood burnings for my tribe before. Um, I would love to get to a point with the blacksmithing where I could do some metal work for them, but I am such a novice that that would be laughable at this point. Um, I have much, much, much more to learn, uh, and I am woefully behind on my studies but once I do get to that point 
and I can actually crank some stuff out. I have some goals in mind for that. I really want to make some things. Um, so those are the kind of things that you can do for gifting within your tribe. You don't have to do it during Sumbul. We like to do it during Sumbul because that incorporates the gifting and the exchange of luck into the well for the ritual. It ritualizes it and really kind of drives home the connection that is there. It helps to cement it in the well. You don't have to. You can just do gifting whenever, but as, as heathens, we just kind of like to do it, and that's the Rithgari way. And so that's how we do it. We do it during Sumble. Uh, we do gifting. I always do the first round of gifting, and then as Godi, it's my prerogative, and then everybody that else is going to give gifts. Um, but it's not obligatory. <laughs> it's not mandatory, because some, even at that little amount, can afford that. Not a problem. I am much more interested in my members being there than I am whether or not they've shelled out cash for gifts. That's, that, that's, I mean, if you can, cool, awesome, it's appreciated, it's loved. I try to make sure that I can every year just because I want to show appreciation to my people. Uh, plus, the gift giving helps to forge luck and connection. Uh, it's important to me. So I try to make sure that I can to the best of my ability. And, uh, but if a tribe member is, you know, starving college student and can't make, you know, can't scrounge together enough for gifts that year, I get it. I absolutely get it, especially if they are, you know, strapped because what little they do have their funneling into hearth and clan. Cool. No sweat. No, no hard feelings at all. I'm just glad they're there and they're sharing and that they are participating in some bull. Um, yeah, there's no dishonor there. Um, genuinely not um, we repay each other's gifts through our sacrifices throughout the year um, plenty so there's not any reciprocal debt incurred there uh, it's not like a formalized gift like you would have between tribes or from lord to vassal kind of thing this is a it, it, yule gifts are a little bit different and they are given more as recom <sighs> They're given as appreciation for the other intangibles that we've gotten throughout the year. Um, there's a why behind that. So it's not an incurred debt. If anything, giving a Yule gift is a repayment of debt that's been incurred throughout the year. Um, even if it's just repaying you for the, the wonder and glory that is your companionship throughout the year. Uh, for having your support there with the tribe. So think about those things as you do your Yule celebrations. Remember your whys and why you do this, why you do that. And hopefully you can find a place within your own traditions that you can make the traditions fun. You know, do you make ornaments? You know, one of the things that we used to do with Ridgar back in kind of the early incarnation of the tribe when we had more kids involved is that we would sit down and make, you know, little wooden, uh, little wooden ornaments for the tree. And, you know, during Mother's Night, you know, we'd all get in there and we paint and we do, and then we'd hang them uh, on the tree. And, you know, the further development of all of that would be that the ornaments could then be sacrificed into the fire, to the, the Yule fire at Twelfth Night, and uh, to bless the coming of the year kind of thing, you know. Um, especially if you could do things like write wishes or whatnot on them for the kids. They have a blast with that. Uh, but the entire thing being it's something that you've done, it stores all of the energy and the joy, the participation in Yule, and then releases that energy uh, to the ancestors as they're, you know, they're part of the participation, you know, share in the joy, let me send this to you, kind of thing. So it's, uh, Yule is a very ancestor and tribe focus for me. It's more of a spiritual time of year than it is a religious time of year. So. About time for a segue, but let me wrap this part up first. When you're talking about your traditions and what you want to do for Yule, think about your whys and then enjoy it. Make it fun. Do games, do activities. There are things all over that you can look at. Pennsylvania Dutch have some really cool things that you can pull from that come from Germanic roots. A lot of their hex signs come from Germanic magic roots. Uh, the peppermint pig is a fantastic thing. If you have not looked into it, look into it. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. It is actually a mock-up of a sacrificial boar uh, done in pure peppermint. Uh, and he, when you order this thing, it even comes with a little silver hammer. Everybody wishes on the pig, and you crack the pig, and you have your pieces. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful tradition. I love it. I am so glad that something like this continues to exist. Yule goats are a thing. 
Um, one of the things that we've done before has been effigies. We've done this at gatherings and events, but you could do it at Yuletide too, where you create an effigy that is kind of your elf on a shelf kind of deal, and they are there, they participate. And then at the end, you sacrifice them either to Odin and the gods or to the ancestors so that they can carry all of that enjoyment and all of that participation over. And it's it stores up energy. There's, there's metaphysical reasons why this works, but just from a fun aspect for the kids and an involvement for the kids and to help introduce them to ritualized sacrifice, sacrificial behaviors, such as sacrificing an effigy, it's a wonderful way to do it. And then, in a Frosty the Snowman kind of way, that, in, that, that effigy can be remade the next year and it can even be the same entity and it become your recurring frosty kind of character that comes to visit every Yule and then through the fire goes home and takes all of this to the ancestors. So, fun stuff, fun stuff. Um, I wish we had more kids in the tribe because I have so many ideas for kids that it's, of course, I worked at a boys' home, ran a boys' home for like 15 years, so I think about kids a lot. Uh, so many fun activities that could be done, and they're they're great. They're fantastic. If you guys want to, jump in the comments section below in the Facebook group. You know who I'm talking to. Um, use this as a segue. Jump down there and share your ideas for kids and fun activities, or for adults, fun activities that you can do during Yule. Share them so that you guys can build off of each other's traditions and maybe find something that fits for you. You may be able to take a tradition from another place that you get the why for. You understand your why may be different, but there's a meaningful why there, and they've handed you a how that you can then kind of shape into uh, your, your own tradition. Traditions are huge. So let's roll on a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the religious side of things, because I've talked more about the spiritual side and the cultural side up to this point, because Yule is very much about ancestors. It's very much about hearth, clan, cult, um, tribal cult, all of this boiled into one. That's the main focus of things, but there is a religious element of things. There's a couple of different avenues that individuals tend to take during Yule. This is a time period where two main deities, maybe three, are focused on. Uh, Mother's Night, we, we focus heavily on Frigga because as the mother, <laughs> the consummate mother, uh, the matron, uh, this is the goddess that we pull to uh, when we are dealing with our Desir. This is one that in Sumble we will, I think this Sumble everybody hailed Frigga around the horn because we see that on Mother's Night this is an opportunity for us to recognize not only our spiritual mothers but our religious mother as well uh, through honoring Frigga and the role that she plays within her tribe. It's also an excellent opportunity to recognize the mothers, the figurative mothers, the female leaders, just the females in general of your tribe. Um, Mother's Night is a fantastic time to shed some limelight for those that definitely deserve it. And so, the religious side of things, Frigga is one that we definitely pay attention to. It would not be amiss to do bloat to Frigga. Now, usually we're pretty crunched on time, and like I said, our focus is on the ancestors. So, you know, I, I can't honestly say we always do a bloat to Frigga around Yule, but it would not be inappropriate. It would be very appropriate. Um, similarly, this is a time where uh, you've got the story of the sun being reborn, especially around the solstice and whatnot. So attention being paid to Baldur with the coming of the dawn, the coming of the new year. I mean, there's a lot of rebirth, a lot of new growth, a lot of that shining coming out of the darkness uh, imagery, and there's a lot of mythic parody that goes along there. <laughs> Gee, imagine. And so, <laughs> this it would not be inappropriate to give some kind of offering to Baldur during this time. And absolutely, it's an appropriate time to honor Olden, the Allfather, because this is one of the times where his attention is more heavily turned towards Midgard. This is a time where Odin is more present. This is the time where the Wild Hunt rides. Now, a number of you, I know, have felt the Wild Hunt. You might even have thought to yourself, you know, this might be the Wild Hunt. And I, you have probably been outside and experienced it. I have numerous times. It's actually ridden through our area twice this year. Uh, that I am absolutely certain. One time, it was chasing a particularly nasty Jotun, and there was some damage uh, as a result. The second time that it came through, it was a wild ride, but I didn't, I, I don't think there was anything ill on that particular wind. It was just the wild hunt. 
riding through looking and hunting. I don't think they had a prey at that point. But um, one of the things that I see some heathens uh, jump onto is that, you know, it's a storm that blows through. Well, it's not necessarily a storm. Uh, the wild hunt, Olden is not necessarily, he, he is the storm and the fury, uh, but he's also the wind. You know, the wild hunt itself may have clouds, it may not, uh, but it will have wind. The wind is the riding, the wind is the hunt tearing through, and you will know that wind because it is different. It is not like a wind that you have the rest of the year. It is a wind that has a very palpable feel to it, a very deep presence. And I love to stand outside and hail Olden as they drive by, as they tarry on through the world. And uh, so I love to stand out, give offering to Olden, toast him as he rides by. And it's, it's, a, it's a big thing for me. But it's also important when the wild hunt rides through to be mindful of your <laughs> safety because if they do have something nasty at the head of that wind uh, or wrapped up in the hunt itself, there could be collateral damage. And uh, as there was some this year, uh, not to us, not to our people luckily, but to some surrounding areas, there was, there was some damage. Uh, yeah, there, there was a nasty, um, baleful light of some kind wrapped up in that hunt. Now, there's tons of imagery, there's tons of research out there available on the wild hunt, and you will find different versions throughout as far as who leads the wild hunt and why. A lot of it depends on time period, who the you know ruling parties of the area are at the time, what the cultural background of the area is, what region you're from. Uh, there's so many different things that go into it. And it's not always the same individual, but my version of the wild hunt that I have come to accept as the truth is Olden leads the wild hunt. And the spirits that he wraps up with him into the hunt, uh, they chase down and chase out the baleful and the nasty in preparation for the coming new year. Uh, kind of a cleaning the slate, as it were, the shaking of the celestial etch-a-sketch. And uh, this is uh, an important function for Olden to kind of tidy up the place a little bit and do a little bit of a reset before the coming year. I think it's a very important thing to honor him for as well. But again, these are my views. You know, your views may differ. Your views probably will differ, almost definitely differ. But anyway, you get the point. The point is that there are a number of different religious elements that can be brought into Yule as well. So, you, Yule, is, Yule is the big one for me because it covers the spiritual with the ancestors. Mega, heavy. This is a deep part of Yule for me. Probably the deepest part of Yule for me. Uh, well, it's right up there with the cultural side of things because of tribe, hearth, clan. It's all there. Uh, then, there's the religious side with the gods and goddesses and honoring them and thanking them for what they've done throughout the year and hoping that they will bless us in the coming year. And then, of course, my fourth pillar is the philosophy pillar. Uh, <laughs> that should be fairly self-explanatory, and if it's not, that's because you need to exercise the philosophy side of things. Uh, this is a time of year for introspection. This is a time of year there's Olden's presence is felt, so this is a time for introspection. It's a time for thought. It's a time for reevaluation in this time outside of time, preparing for the year to come. How has your weird converted into Orlog? What Orlog are you bringing into the new year? Where are you at as a result? You are in your Vertandi. You know, Urd is before, Skuld is yet to come. Urd is going to be there. She's not going anywhere. Skuld, you'll get there. But for the time being, enjoy being in the moment with Vertandi. This is an excellent time to stop and smell the roses, as it were. This is an excellent time to stop and appreciate those that are around you, those that ma matter the most to you, or those things that matter the most to you in your life. Because um, everybody's situation is different. Everybody's picture of their Inangarth, their family, whatever, is different. For some people, it's much more hearth than clan, because people are estranged from their clan. Um, those that don't have tribe obviously don't have that element. So hearth becomes the epicenter of everything for them, as it should be. Hearth is the epicenter of all to begin with. He, the, hearth, the hearth is where the heathen is. That is the crux of everything. 
it all begins in the hearth, and that is where your sanctum is. Whether it's just you alone, or it's you and spouse and kids, or you and spouse and animals, or you and friends, or whatever your hearth situation is, the hearth is the crux of it. And that's where your focus needs to be. In my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. So, other things to take into account during Yuletide is that this is an excellent time for storytelling. If you haven't already incorporated this in your traditions, I highly recommend either some mythic storytelling tying things to the gods and goddesses, some tribal specific storytelling, which is the best, or even just keeping alive folk tales. Because with the veil being thin, it's an excellent time to be able to tap into the energies that help to weave the spoken spell. And ritualized storytelling helps to perpetuate hearth traditions and beliefs and values tribal beliefs and values, clan beliefs and values, religious beliefs and values, it is an excellent time to embrace all of that and roll it up in tied into one. There's, there's an old European tradition of telling ghost stories around Yuletide. Uh, Christmas ghost stories, Yuletide ghost stories. It's a common thing. But there's a reason why that essence of storytelling is so strong around this time of year. One, the veil is thin, so the things that go bump in the night can bump a little easier. Uh, but two, that's the, the tie to the magic that makes the spoken spell of storytelling is it, it, it's uniquely strong this time of year. And uh, those that weave the spoken spell know what I'm talking about, I think, I hope. And uh, yeah. Yule is a fantastic time for storytelling. Singing, storytelling, whatever your particular uh, MO is, whatever your you know, art form, embrace it. Take it on. Especially be in the moment with Arthandi and weave a spell for those people around you. Let that be part of your gift to them. I think that you will find it to be a very fulfilling and moving experience. So anyway, as we wrap up, look to the new year. Look to 2022 and see where your energies need to take you. Uh, be prepared to take those first steps, but don't feel so rushed. You know, Enjoy Yule while it's here. Be ready to uh, cinch up the bootstraps and get to work when the time comes. Because it's a new year. It's time to do new things. It's time to grow. It's time to be strong. Some to look back at the year before and go, you know, we could have done some things differently. We could have done some things better. Let's do it. And I know that's something that I'm trying to do with my people and especially with myself. And I'm very excited to see what I can do. Um, I'm hoping that this next year is going to be a good one. Or at least one that is marked by forward movement and growth. That's my hope. That's what I'm going to put my energies towards. So, Yuletide is a great time to do New Year's resolutions, but <laughs> as heathens, we understand a little bit differently than the layman when it comes to New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions are one thing. Yuletide oaths are different. When you make a Yuletide oath, you keep your Yuletide oath. Um, Usually it's an oath to do something before the, you know, this time next year, something throughout the year that you are going to do to bring honor to your tribe, to bring honor to your hearth, and build the gefrain, build the luck of the tribe, build your representation within it, establish your worth, and it's something that you're good at. It's something that may be a bit of a challenge. It's not just a throwaway. That way it's actually meaningful. And this is something that you can boast about at Yule the following year, when you show off what you've done. But make sure you set your shield, because if you do not, if you don't have some kind of recompense for that, um, the damage can be devastating. So keep that in mind. Uh, set reasonable goals that you can meet with a bit of challenge, but still can meet uh, realistically. And make sure you set an appropriate shield that will help to protect the luck and well-being of the tribe should you for some reason fail. And uh, 
Yeah. Make sure you talk it out with your host, whoever's hosting your Yule celebration first. Uh, don't spring oaths on individuals during Sumble. It's bad manners. Uh, because it does tie together the weird of everybody that's involved in the ritual. It's highly important that you talk about these things ahead of time, figure out what the host's rules are with regards to oathing around the horn, uh, if they are the ones that are hosting the actual sumbul, which typically they are, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Uh, different uh, tribes have different ways of going about things, but make sure that you have an understanding of what the expectations are, what the rules are, and you come in already having an idea of what your shield could be and present it and see if the tribe, clan, hearth, accepts it. And then you can make your oath, and then you can fulfill your oath and do wonderful things, and that is... It's how a heathen does New Year's resolutions. We don't say, oh, I'm just going to go to the gym more often, or oh, I'm going to lose some weight next year. And we say, no, 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 no. I'm going to build a thing. I'm going to do a thing. I'm going to make... Uh, one of the oaths that I did one year was that I was going to write three essays throughout the year. Um, two of them being opinion pieces, kind of deals, a blog type deal. And then one being a hard research essay where I went and scoured through books and did MLA formatting and all this stuff and typed up with, you know, appropriate documentation, all this as a scholarly type essay for the tribe. Uh, not something that I sought any kind of publication for, but simply something that I did for the tribe. And then I've had other ones that I've done, teaching classes throughout the year to ensure that I'm doing my part in spreading tradition for the tribe and helping to see to the growth of the tribe spiritually. Um, and each time I've done this, I've had good results. So. That's how a heathen does New Year's re resolutions, in my opinion. <laughs> all right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up here. So thank you all for the support throughout the year for three years. Holy crap. Um, I'd love to see those numbers bump up a little bit more. I think the last time I checked, we were just shy of 3,000. I think I'm like 2,900 something. Uh, I would love to see those numbers bump up, maybe hit another milestone. Um, just for fun to see what it does. So feel free to share things around. Let other heathens know about it. Um, yeah, if you like the content, you like what I share, and you like my approach to things, let other people in on the secret. Let them know what's going on, and we'll see where things go in the coming year. I'm excited for it, and I hope that you'll stick around to see where the channel goes and what kind of fun things I can get into. Um, gonna set my sights on trying to do some more varied things as far as the channel goes. We'll see. Um, yeah, you know, the work schedule, the weirdness of energy and whatnot, because I'm going all the time. I am not making any oaths with regards to that, because I have no way of knowing this time next year what kind of setup I'm going to have, what my situation is going to be. Too many things in flux. So, But I would like to turn some attention to maybe diversifying things a little bit and trying a little something different on for size. We'll see. <laughs> Fingers crossed. It's a hope. It's a dream. We'll see. Anyway. Hail to you all. Thank you. Glad you. And may your hearth fires burn bright. Hail. All right, we're going to give this a shot. Let's see how it goes. I know I say that like every time. <laughs> it's because you guys don't see the ones that don't make it. That's the thing. It's because, you know, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll be like, mm, nope, that's not going to do. And then kick it back. Most of the time, though, I can get it done in one, one cut. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll give it a shot. So uh, updates as far as game stuff goes. Not a lot right now. Holding off until after the first of the year. Then we're going to have another game session, hopefully. Fingers crossed. See if I can make things match up. Because uh, I'm super psyched about getting my players back at the table. They're all psyched about it. Stoked. Uh, folks got new dice and stuff for for Yule and are all like Jones into play. I'm Jones into play. Um, then I'm actually looking at yeah, lots of, lots of fun stuff for this particular campaign. Um, I've got all kinds of ideas running around in my head, and I'm super super stoked about it. So digging it, digging it. Looking forward to getting back in the saddle as far as game goes. Other than that, rocking along, um, playing some of my backlog on the Switch. Uh, I think right now I'm playing Saints Row 4. Um, also playing Animal Crossing, but that's, you know, I got into Animal Crossing late. Um, I'm sitting here rocking along, but I finally have my island up to five stars and all that, and, and uh, 
This is this meaningless to people that don't play Animal Crossing. I get it. Eh. But I'll have a few out there to play, just because there's always a few. Uh, pretty much any fandom I throw out there, there's usually at least a couple in the uh, group that, you know, are part of that fandom or, you know, like it, whatever. And uh, so, yeah, Animal Crossing. My, I've done a lot on my island. I'm working on my Vey area in the island because, of course, you know the Gothi's going to go and create a Vey on his Animal Crossing island. Uh, I'm trying to collect all the all of the uh, gnomes because I'm using them for local Vey tier. It's a, it's a Vey tier Vey uh, kind of thing. So it's it's focused heavily on, like, the Vey tier plants, some statues and stuff in there. But uh, it's, it's a big work in progress because I don't have all the pieces that I want for it yet. And then eventually, once I have a plethora of bells saved up, I'm going to buy the castle pieces and make myself a keep and all that stuff. But I've got the Ridgar binder and plastered all over my island. And just, you know, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's stupid fun. But I enjoy it. It's a thing. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, Yule is rocking along great. So, you know, loving it. I'm working my butt off, though. Uh, stupid long hours and not getting to enjoy as much of it as I would like. But I am making quality time out of those times that I do get. Uh, had a fantastic feast with the tribe and, you know, the Rithgari gathered and we had a fantastic time. And it was good time spent with good people, something I desperately needed. Um, then I'm looking forward to the new year, looking at hopefully getting some park mates scheduled more on the regular. We've got a new group of newbies that have kind of come up in the area. And so I'm excited about having, you know, some more action going on in the East Texas area, try and create some networking potential for some people and uh, just kind of help to foster that along in the area. So uh, beyond that, life is life and it's rocking along. So. There's more that I plan to do over the coming year. Uh, my plans that I set out for this year as far as trying to do more project-oriented videos and things like that did not pan out. Um, yeah, a mixture of not having the time and not having the energy because I am dog-tired all the time. And so my projects are heavily on the back burner at the moment. Uh, I haven't even fired my lathe up in a little while. I haven't done any wood burning in a bit. Uh, there, there's a lot that I need to do, and um, my poor forge has been cold for so long that it's, uh, I'm going to have to rework a bunch of stuff on it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's life. You know how it is. But uh, as things level out and as things, you know, strengthen up a bit, I'm hoping that there will be some good news in that forefront going forward. We shall see. I may regret this. Oh, dear gods, that's bright. Ah, it just gets brighter. Ah! No. Yeah, no, we're just going to lose it and go with the natural light. Sorry, this thing has a light on it, but I don't like it. So we're just going to stay here. You guys don't need to see my ugly face that close anyway. So we're all right. Shadow is my friend. Yes. Anyway, onwards and upwards, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode. Ready? We are live in three, two, one. Let's jam. 